Hi, my name is Amanda. I work for the University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Lab, located on Savannah River site here in beautiful Aiken, South Carolina. Probably wondering, how did University of Georgia end up in South Carolina? Well, we're going to take a quick look back in time and find out exactly how we ended up here. Rumors of change have been circulating, but many hoped that they were not true. At noon on November 28, 1950, as everyone quietly waited around the radio, the government released the news. It planned to seize roughly 310 square miles of land, forcing five towns to relocate their homes, graves, and businesses from Aiken and Barnwell counties in South Carolina. The government was going to build the Savannah River plant to manufacture hydrogen bomb parts. Locals called the Savannah River plant the bomb plant, but, but no bombs have been created here. Two key radioactive ingredients in hydrogen bombs would be processed at this facility, tritium and plutonium. In 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission became concerned with the environmental impacts that may be occurring. They invited several universities to conduct baseline studies of the ecosystems found on site. These universities performed their research and left, but not Dr. Eugene Odom from the University of Georgia. Dr. Odom saw an opportunity, had an idea, and presented it to the Atomic Energy Commission. Odom wanted to look at ecological succession, which is a long-term study. Ecological succession is the process of rebuilding an ecosystem when a disaster destroys it. Odom had access to land that had been farmed since the mid-1800s and would be returning to nature. What returned first, plants, animals, insects? The Atomic Energy Commission approved his proposal and even gave him a $10,000 grant. This would be the birth of the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory and a second home to the father of modern ecology, Dr. Eugene Odom. In 1972, Savannah River site would become the first national environmental research park, providing opportunities for researchers to study the environmental impacts of energy and defense-related technologies next to pristine reference sites. The Ecology Lab has been located on Savannah River site for over 70 years now. We still provide an environmental impact statement to the Department of Energy, as well as conduct research, education, and outreach. We hope you enjoy the rest of the show. We've been learning about amphibians since we were in grade school. Some of us love them, while others can't stand them. Regardless of how we feel about them, they play an essential role in the environment around us, and that we should care about. Amphibians eat many insects, including those that damage our crops, and even those pesky mosquitoes that carry diseases. The role of predator is not the only function amphibians have. They are also prey to other animals and are a vital part of the food web in aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. There are some basic characteristics one should know about an amphibian. Amphibians are ectothermic or cold-blooded, which means they need external energy, like the sun, to control their body temperature. Amphibians have a unique life cycle, utilizing both aquatic and terrestrial habitats. Amphibians have permeable skin, meaning it allows the liquids and gases to pass through it. If an amphibian becomes too dry, it can suffocate from not getting enough oxygen through its skin and will die. And lastly, amphibians are excellent indicator species of the health of an environment. Amphibian comes from the Greek word amphibios, meaning a being with a double life. Some say their name refers to amphibians living in two places, like on land and in water. While dual residence is the rule for most amphibians, there are always exceptions, which we will see later. The life cycle of an amphibian consists of three stages, egg, larva, and adult. As the amphibian grows, it moves through these stages in a process known as metamorphosis. It is important to note that the amphibian eggs are jelly-like and do not have a hard protective shell. Most amphibians lay their eggs and move on, showing no parental care. Once hatched, the time spent as a larva depend on several factors such as species, temperature, food source, etc. Once adulthood is reached, most species move on to land. Amphibians are affected directly by changes in the environment, which can occur at any stage of development. Examples of those changes include pollution, parasites, and habitat destruction, to name a few. Amphibians also absorb gases through their skin, making them susceptible to air pollutants. These changes have cascading effects on other aspects of the ecosystem. As stated before, amphibians are an essential part of the food web. 
Now let's look at a few examples of frogs and toads found here in the CSRA. There are 36 species of frogs and toads in Georgia and South Carolina, with one introduced frog, the greenhouse frog, and one invasive frog, the Cuban tree frog. Both frogs happen to be from Cuba and have moved up from Florida. So, what is the difference between introduced and invasive? Both are non-native, meaning they did not originate from their current location. Introduced species do not hinder or prevent the survival of others within their ecosystem. They simply exist in the environment. Invasive species are non-native species that cause harm to the environment, economy, or human, animal, or plant health. Removal of invasive species is highly encouraged. The American bullfrog is the largest frog species in the U.S. and is native to the eastern United States. These large frogs prefer slow-moving waters such as lakes, ponds, and small streams. One identifying characteristic of a bullfrog is that the dorsal folds start behind the eye and go down behind the tympanic membrane rather than down the back like other frogs. Bullfrogs show sexual dimorphism in the size of the tympanic membrane. Males have a large membrane compared to the female. The tympanic membrane allows frogs to hear both in the air and underwater. Bullfrogs are ferocious predators and feed on anything that they can swallow, from snakes, worms, insects, crustaceans, small rodents, and even birds if they can catch them. This has become an issue where bullfrogs have been introduced west of the Mississippi. They are now an invasive species causing harm to the ecosystems and negatively affecting biodiversity. Fun fact, most frog species use their eyes to push their food down into their throat to swallow. When you don't have teeth, you adapt and overcome. The next frog we will highlight is Georgia's state amphibian, the green tree frog. Green tree frogs are insect eaters and can often be found near porch lights feeding at night. It's not hard to figure out how this species got its name. These frogs come in various shades of green and are boreal, meaning they climb up in trees and shrubs. How do frogs climb so well? Mucus. Yep, those sticky tree frog toe pads have mucus pores between the epithelial cells. The pores release mucus that flows around the cells to clean and coat the pad, allowing for optimum adhesion to any surface. Fun fact, only the male frogs and toads have vocal sacs that help amplify their mating calls. So all those frogs you hear at night are males calling, hoping to attract a female. Here's another insect eater that prefers to stay a little lower to the ground, the southern toad. The southern toad is the most common toad in the southern United States. It can be differentiated from other species by the two cranial crests located on the top of its head between the eyes. Southern toads breed in shallow water and their eggs and tadpoles are subject to the environment. For this reason, females can lay up to 4,000 eggs in the hopes that a few will survive. Southern toads are great for insect control, but they do have many predators, so they have developed physical and chemical defenses. When a predator attacks, the first thing a toad does is puff up to look large. If they are too big to eat, then hopefully the predator will move on. If that does not work, the toad will hunch over and begin releasing a bufotoxin from the parotid glands found on the back. This causes some dogs and cats to start foaming at the mouth and can even cause them to vomit. So are toads frogs? Yes, but frogs are not toads. There are some fundamental differences in skin texture and leg structure, but both frogs and toads remain the same when it comes to having permeable skin and playing a vital role in the ecosystem. Frogs and toads are not the only type of amphibians we can find here in the CSRA. We also have a wide variety of salamanders. Many of our salamanders prefer to live near ephemeral wetlands. Ephemeral wetlands can be completely dry certain times of the year, but quickly soak up water like a sponge during the wet season. Because these wetlands temporarily hold water, they do not have fish. This makes for an excellent breeding habitat for many amphibians. As larvae, many of the salamanders eat insects, small crustaceans, and other aquatic invertebrates. Adult salamanders have a sticky tongue to catch earthworms, snails, spiders, centipedes, and other invertebrates they find on the forest floor. 
South Carolina's state amphibian is the spotted salamander, which is named for the two rows of yellow or orange spots on its back. Like many other amphibians, spotted salamanders secrete a milky toxin from glands in their skin when threatened by a predator. Spotted salamanders have a mutualistic relationship with algae. The algae raises the oxygen content of the egg, aiding in development. In turn, ammonia waste from embryos create a nitrogen-rich environment that is thought to be optimal for the algae's metabolism. Scientists are still discovering more regarding this relationship. Here is a salamander that does not lay its eggs in the water. It can lay up to 100 eggs in a depression on land, typically under a log or leaf litter. The female stays with the eggs until rain fills the wetland and triggers the eggs to hatch. This form of parental care is unusual in amphibians. The marble salamander also displays sexual dimorphism. Males are bright white and black, while fem females are more of a silver and black. Fun fact, the Southern Appalachian Mountains support the highest salamander diversity of any region on Earth. Remember how I mentioned that there are always exceptions to the rules? Well, the amphiuma is one of those exceptions. This salamander remains aquatic once it reaches the adult stage of development. The two-toed amphiuma is the longest salamander species in the United States, reaching up to four feet in length. They can be found in most aquatic habitats, and many people think they are eels. They possess strong jaws and have two rows of razor-sharp teeth that they use to catch and eat other salamanders, frogs, and crayfish. Adults have no external gills or eyelids and must surface to breathe. Fun fact! Amphiumas can survive droughts by burrowing in the mud and coating themselves in mucus. We previously mentioned that amphibians are indicators of a healthy ecosystem, but it's important to point out that amphibians are in decline. Habitat destruction and pollution are two main culprits, but disease is definitely in the top five. Chytrid is a fungus that has now spread all over the world and is wiping out amphibian populations. How did chytrid spread? Humans and the pet trade. Ranaviruses are another disease that are causing problems for amphibians. It is estimated that 41% of the world's amphibian populations are at risk of dying out. Amphibians play an important role in keeping the ecosystem balanced. They also benefit humans. Salamanders can regenerate their limbs. Scientists have found that the same gene used in regeneration of limbs is found in humans. We have four of our native species of frogs can actually tolerate being frozen. Researchers have found that quite interesting when it comes to organ transplants. Medical science is continually advancing in part due to amphibians. The least we can do is help protect them and their environments. Now let's take a look at some of our native reptiles. Reptiles are a key component of the food web in most ecosystems. They help control the numbers of pests by consuming rodents and insects and serve as prey to larger mammals and other reptiles. Like amphibians, reptiles are ectothermic and rely on the environment around them to regulate their body temperature. Most reptiles have scutes or scales covering their skin as a form of protection and many lay eggs on land, then leave showing no parental care. Of course, there are some exceptions. Lastly, reptiles in general are long-lived and tend to reach sexual maturity slowly. This makes protecting them and their habitats even more important. It may take 20 to 30 years for a tortoise to reach sexual maturity and find a mate before reproducing. Roughly 70% of the turtles globally are either vulnerable or endangered due to human-related impacts. Habitat destruction, poaching, disease, and climate change are just a few. There would be a significant loss in our ecosystems and many cultures if turtles were lost forever. Herpetologist Whit Gibbons said it best, if you took away all the ferris wheels in amusement parks, you'd still have amusement parks, but they'd be a little less exciting, wouldn't they? All turtles and tortoises have a carapace and plastron. The carapace consists of the vertebra, ribs, spinal cord, and nerve endings. The turtle's shell is an adaptation to help protect its organs from predators. And while turtles and tortoises may be shaped similarly, they definitely walk differently. Turtles are plantigrades, meaning they walk flat on their feet with toes pointed out unless they have flippers, and tortoises are digigrades, meaning they walk on their toes similar to elephants. Lastly, tortoises are land-only animals and do not swim. So all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises.
Box turtles are relatively common in our area, but do you know why they call them box turtles? It is because they have a hinged plastron, and when they feel threatened, they can close themselves inside their shells. Juvenile box turtles do not have a hinge on their plastron until they are four or five years old, when they reach sexual maturity. Male box turtles have a red or orange eye and a concave plastron. Many people think box turtles only eat vegetables, but box turtles are actually scavengers and eat fruit, insects, mushrooms, and even carrion or dead animals. So, is a box turtle a tortoise or a turtle? It spends most of its time on land, but not all of it. It has slightly webbed feet, making them turtles. Another turtle that is very popular in the pet trade is the spotted turtle. These small aquatic turtles are black with yellow spots and have a gentle demeanor. Spotted turtles are considered habitat specialists, requiring thick vegetation, shallow water, and a varying diet of snails, worms, slugs, and other insects. These turtles do not reach sexual maturity until they are 8 to 10 years old and only live to be roughly 25 years old. They lay 2 to 3 eggs each season. Interestingly, the spotted turtle is most active during the cool days of spring and fall. Due to poaching and habitat fragmentation, populations are declining. While this next turtle can be found in the pet trade, this is not what it was once poached for. It was initially caught for food. Common snapping turtles get up to roughly 40 or 50 pounds. Once they reach a certain size, they have few predators other than humans. Don't be fooled though, they have a powerful jaw and will bite if they feel threatened. Common snapping turtles will most likely leave a scar but not take a finger off. Snapping turtles are sit and wait predators. Since they have a reduced plastron and must protect their underneath, they tend to bury themselves in soft mud with only their heads exposed. Their long, flexible necks can reach up until only the tip of their snouts reach the surface. At the very end of their snout, the nostrils serve as a snorkel, allowing the turtle to breathe occasionally without drawing attention. Common snapping turtles are often confused with the alligator snapping turtle. Both are found in Georgia, but only the common snapping turtle is located here in the CSRA. Georgia's state reptile is the only tortoise native to the southeast, the gopher tortoise. Gopher tortoises grow up to be 15 inches long or roughly the size of a basketball. With their strong elephant-like back legs and front feet specialized for digging, they are well adapted to burrowing. Gopher tortoises grow slowly, taking 10 to 20 years to reach maturity, and may live to be 50 years or older. Because of its slow growth rate and reproduction, this species can take decades to recover from population declines. The burrows provide gopher tortoises with protection from predators and from the elements by maintaining a constant temperature inside. Burrow depth and length varies, but the range is roughly 6 feet deep and approximately 30 feet long. The burrows tend to twist and turn and descend at a 20 to 40 degree angle, which is another reason they have those strong elephant-like back legs to push themselves up the incline. More than 350 other species of invertebrates and vertebrates use the burrows with the tortoise. This includes North America's longest snake, the endangered indigo snake, and the endangered gopher frog. Because so many other species depend on these burrows, gopher tortoises are considered a keystone species. When building an arch, the center stone is called a keystone. If that keystone is removed, the whole arch collapses. Remove a keystone species and the whole ecosystem drastically changes. Species go extinct. It sounds easy. We just need to protect the tortoises, right? Tortoises require a specific habitat, like the longleaf pine forest, with well-drained sandy soil, little tree cover, and abundant herbaceous ground cover. The habitat is fire and gopher tortoise dependent. Fire removes the pine needles, allowing seeds to reach the forest floor, and gopher tortoises disperse seeds with digestion. So, like many of the species we have already covered, we not only need to protect the animal, but its habitat as well. Habitat loss and fragmentation, human interaction, including collision with vehicle, predation by domestic animals, and disease are among the leading causes of death for gopher tortoises. However, there are several healthy populations right here in the CSRA, that are thriving thanks to scientists at the Ecology Lab. The Aiken Gopher Tortoise Heritage Preserve, Fort Gordon, and McDuffie PFA 
have all worked with researchers, foresters, and Department of Natural Resources to provide a safe and suitable habitat. If you see a turtle crossing the road and you want to help it, um, please don't relocate it. Just move it in the direction that it was going. Um, turtles have an excellent homing instinct and know exactly where they're headed. There you go, buddy. Lizards are reptiles we are all familiar with. The native green anole can be found in a variety of habitats and are generally arboreal, but we can find them almost anywhere. Anoles are often seen perched on fences and rooftops basking. Some call anoles chameleons, but chameleons can change color based on the background. Anoles change color based on external factors, such as temperature and humidity, or hormones. For example, many anoles found under logs on cool days are often brown, but turn green as they warm up. Males fighting will also change color as a result of hormones. Male and female green anoles look very similar, but they are sexually dimorphic. The males have a dewlap or throat fan. They, the male will display this dewlap to attract females or when establishing territory against other males. You might also notice that anoles display countershading. This is a common occurrence in both reptiles and amphibians. This helps to blend in with the light colored sky when observed from below. This lizard species is often mistaken for a snake because it is legless. It is called a glass lizard. A few characteristics that show this is a lizard and not a snake would be the fixed jaw, movable eyelids, and ear openings. And like other lizards, the glass lizard can drop its tail as a self-defense mechanism to distract predators and escape. This mechanism is known as autotomy or self-amputation. Lizards are born with lines of weakness in their tail called fracture planes. The pulling apart of the muscle causes the tail to fall off along the lines of weakness. Lizard tail autotomy has developed so that when the tail breaks, there is no blood loss, and the tail regrows over six months to a year. The tail skeleton is replaced by a rod of cartilage with new muscles growing around it, producing a replacement tail that is usually shorter and less colored compared to the original. The next time the lizard needs to escape, it must drop its tail above the old break. Eventually, the lizard will not have any fracture planes left for dropping its tail and will have to rely on stealth and speed. This is why we suggest observing rather than handling. Autotomy is the lizard's greatest defense. We're now gonna take a look at the most diverse set of reptiles in our area, snakes. Many people like them, most people despise them, but the fact remains the same. They play an important role in our ecosystem, and the more we understand about them, the more we can give them space to do their job. Rat snakes are one of the most commonly seen snakes. They range in color variation and can reach lengths up to five or six feet. Often called chicken snakes, for getting into chicken coops, these snakes will also eat eggs, small birds, and rodents. Once a rat snake catches its meal, it constricts it before consuming it. Rat snakes are known for being strong climbers and can easily scale a brick wall or large tree with no limbs. Rat snakes are fairly slow moving. When approached in the open, an individual will often lie still and kink its body so that it somewhat resembles a crooked stick. If this does not work, many snakes will mimic other snakes. A rat snake will flatten its head to make it look triangular shaped and will flick the tip of its tail and leaf litter to sound like a rattlesnake. If that still doesn't work, the snake may resort to striking or musking. Snake musk is milky white substance that is oily and very foul smelling. This defense is to ward off predators from eating the snake. The Eastern King Snake is probably best known for being a predator of venomous snakes. This is true, king snakes do eat a variety of venomous snakes as long as they are small enough. King snakes have a natural immunity to pit viper venom. Scientists are continually learning more about these resistances, but at least some of their resistance comes from antibodies or chemicals in their blood that interfere with the venom. King snakes eat much more than just venomous snakes, though. They feed on non-venomous snakes, lizards, turtle eggs, salamanders, and small mammals. Sadly, king snake populations are on the decline due to habitat loss, road mortalities, and overcollection for the pet trade. The eastern hognose has its eyes set on an Emmy. Eastern hognose snakes are docile animals that bluff and play dead to discourage predators. Initially, the snake will inflate its body, flatten its neck, 
coil its tail, and often turn sideways, hiss by expelling air from the lungs, and occasionally strike without biting. If this does not deter the predator and the snake is touched, it will act as if it's in pain and agony, rolling around and sticking its tongue out. After a minute or so of this behavior, the snake will lie on its back and become completely limp, as if it's dead. It will remain limp if it is picked up, and if you attempt to correct it and lay it on its ventral side, it will roll back over on its back. Once left alone, the snake will make sure the coast is clear and move on. The only thing that should fear a hognose snake is a toad. Hognose snakes survive almost exclusively on a diet of toads. The upturned snout, which gives the snake its name, is perfect for digging a toad out of the dirt. Hognose snakes have rear fangs, which make great toad poppers. A toad inflates itself with air to look bigger, more threatening, and potentially hard to swallow. Once the toad is in the snake's mouth, the fangs deflate it, make it an easier to swallow for the hognose. Toads are off the menu for many predators because of the toxin they secrete. It makes most animals sick, but the hognose has evolved immunity to the toxins. The last non-venomous snake we will briefly review is the scarlet king snake. This snake uses Batesian mimicry, meaning it mimics the appearance of a venomous snake in hopes that predators will leave it alone. In the wild, this probably works, but with humans, not so much. When people see a red, black, and yellow snake, the first thing they think of is a venomous coral snake, which is what this snake is mimicking. But that mistaken identity will often cost the snake its life. Scarlet king snakes typically inhabit pine forest, but have been found in just about every habitat. They are secretive and usually found under bark, logs, rocks, and other debris. The rhyme, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, friend of Jack, works here in the southeast, but that saying does not apply outside of the U.S. It is best not to handle a snake if you do not know the species or what you are doing. Coral snakes are venomous, and their venom contains a neurotoxin. If bitten by a coral snake, at first there may be little to no reaction for up to 12 hours. However, if left untreated, the neurotoxin begins to disrupt the connections between the brain and the muscles, causing slurred speech, double vision, and muscular paralysis, eventually ending in respiratory or cardiac failure. Coral snakes are extremely reclusive and generally bite humans only when handled or stepped on. Coral snakes live in the wooded, sandy, and marshy areas of the southeastern United States and spend most of their lives burrowed underground or in leaf piles. They eat lizards, frogs, and other snakes. Coral snakes have front fixed fangs, meaning they do not retract like other venomous snakes. Moving on to our native pit vipers, which have venom comprised of hemotoxin. Hemotoxic venom affects clotting factors in the blood as well as destroys red blood cells. This can also result in kidney problems as the kidneys struggle to filter out the large amount of dead blood cells. Other symptoms consist of intense pain, severe swelling, edema, and numbness, just to name a few. While the eastern diamondback rattlesnake is the largest venomous snake in North America, it is not found here in the CSRA. We do have the canebrake, or timber rattlesnake. This large, heavy-bodied snake has chevron-like bands down its back. It is an ambush predator, so it sits and waits for its food to come by. Like all pit vipers, the fangs are just like hypodermic needles and replaced periodically. This keeps them sharp for injecting venom as well as helping to pull the food into the mouth. As stated previously, everything has a place and purpose in the ecosystem. The rattlesnake is food for other predators, but we as humans actually benefit from the rattlesnakes. One study from the University of Maryland showed that timber rattlesnakes were keeping rodent populations in check therefore indirectly keeping ticks at bay. It is important to note that these snakes do not want anything to do with us. When they feel threatened, they give a warning by rattling their tails and attempting to escape. The smallest rattlesnake in our area maxes out at about two feet long. It does have a tiny rattle that it warns predators with, but it is so small most humans cannot hear it. Pygmy rattlesnakes are known to, to use gopher tortoise burrows as well as other mammal holes. These snakes have a diverse palate, feeding on lizards, frogs, centipedes, insects, and small rodents. The copperhead can be distinguished by the hourglass-shaped or Hershey kiss-shaped crossbands down the length of the body. 
This venomous snake can live in the most diverse habitats and is often found in urban areas. Copperheads are opportunistic feeders and are known to consume a variety of prey, ranging from amphibians, insects, reptiles, and small rodents. Juvenile copperheads have a yellow tip tail that they will use as a lure to help capture their prey. Research has shown that a protein in the copperhead venom has slowed certain cancers from growing in mice. This has not gone to human trials at this time. The last venomous snake found in our area is hated by many people and often misunderstood. The cottonmouth, or water moccasin, is a semi-aquatic, heavy-bodied snake. These snakes are often seen basking on logs, rocks, or branches at the water's edge, but seldom climb high in a tree. They are often confused with non-venomous water snakes that are commonly seen basking on branches several feet above the water. The cottonmouth received its name from the whiteness on the inside of the mouth that is exposed as a defensive display. Like the rattlesnake, cottonmouths typically give a warning before striking. These snakes can be found in nearly all freshwater habitats, but are most common in cypress swamps, river floodplains, and heavily vegetated wetlands, where there is an abundance of food such as fish and amphibians. If you encounter a snake and are unsure of the identification, the best thing to do is to walk away. You may snap a picture to help with identification later, but relying on the triangle head means venomous or round eyes versus elliptical eyes may get you in trouble if you are not confident. As mentioned before, many snakes can flatten their head to mimic a venomous snake. And just like humans, snake eyes dilate with the absence of light. Pit vipers have heat sensing pits, but it is best just to keep your distance regardless. If you find a snake shed skin, you can determine if it was venomous or non-venomous by looking at the scales below the anal plate on the shed. Venomous snakes have a single row of scales. Non-venomous snakes have a double row. However, this does not work for the coral snake. The chances of being bitten by a venomous snake are slim and can be avoided, but if you are bitten, your chances of dying are slim, thanks to the advanced medical care found here in the United States. If bitten, try to remain calm. Remove any constricting jewelry or watches from the affected area. Take note of the snake's size and appearance or snap a cell phone picture and contact your local emergency personnel. Do not cut, suck, or use a tourniquet on the affected area as this can do more damage. Do not try to capture or kill the snake. The last reptile we will cover today is an endangered species success story, the American alligator, which you can easily distinguish from the crocodile by the shape of the snout. Alligators have a long and round snout, U-shaped if you look down on the head, while crocodiles have a long pointed snout that are more V-shaped. The alligator was once overharvested, but is now farmed and hunted due to the booming populations. The alligator population might be doing well, but research shows that they are starting to see issues with habitat loss, climate change, and pollution. Alligators are long-lived, exceeding 60 years in the wild. Male alligators reach roughly 14 feet in length, and females reach approximately 9 to 10 feet. Of course, there are always exceptions. Like gopher tortoises, alligators are considered keystone species. Alligators create dens or burrows that they utilize for shelter and to attract prey. The extra water present in alligator holes is beneficial to many other wildlife species. Alligators also use these burrows to help with thermoregulation or regulating their body temperatures. If they are getting too hot, they may enter the burrow to cool off. Another neat adaptation alligators have are their scoots. These bony protrusions act as a form of protection as well as help to retain heat for thermoregulation, which allows for proper digestion. Many reptiles stop eating in the wintertime due to not being able to heat up enough to digest their food before it sours in their stomach. Mother alligators build and defend their nests against predators throughout the incubation period, which is approximately 65 days. When the eggs are ready to hatch, the mother alligator digs into the nest mound, opens any eggs that have not hatched, and carries the young down to the water. Females will sometimes aggressively defend their young for more than a year. The young will even call to their mother when in distress. This type of parental care is not frequently found in the reptile world. The nest the female builds is another reason alligators are considered a keystone species. Many other reptiles may use the nest to lay their eggs, such as turtles and lizards.
Alligators have a nictitating membrane to protect their eyes so that they can see underwater. This is like having built-in goggles. Alligators have a strong homing instinct. Therefore, biologists have discovered that relocating individual alligators is ineffective as they can return home even after they've been relocated more than 100 miles. Given this incredible ability to navigate, it is now illegal to relocate alligators. Since re relocation is not an option, when an alligator is removed, it is killed by a licensed alligator specialist. Nuisance alligators are typically alligators that have been fed by humans and become accustomed. This is very dangerous. Remember, a fed alligator is a dead alligator. Alligators are extremely fast in the water, using their long, powerful tails to propel them through the water. While alligators can run fast on land, they tend to tire out quickly as it takes a lot of energy for their short legs to lift their heavy bodies. There is no need to run in zigzag patterns when evading an alligator. Just run in the opposite direction as quickly as possible. The goal is to evade the strong jaws of an alligator. American alligators have the third strongest biting force of all mammals with 2,125 pounds per square inch of pressure. Humans have a mere 170 PSI. Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians like the ones discussed today. Herpetologists study their behavior, development, genetics, and much more in hopes of understanding their ecological impacts and environments. The work of herpetologists is important for the conservation of threatened and endangered species, but you don't have to be a herpetologist to help your native reptiles and amphibians. It can be as simple as not dumping chemicals down the drains, not releasing non-native pets or plants into the environment, or just being a voice and telling others. I hope you enjoyed learning about some of our native reptiles and amphibians. That's just a glimpse into some of the biodiversity you can find right outside your back door. I leave you with this though. Just like the reptiles and amphibians we learned about in the video today, we also have a purpose and place in this ecosystem. What is your contribution to the environment? Thank you.